What's up, guys? It is time for another betting breakdown. This time for UFC 273, we have two title fights on the card. Alexander Volkanovsky defending his title against the Korean Zombie, a.k.a. Chan Sung Jung. And we also got Algerman Sterling defending his title, kinda, against Piotr Jan. Basically, you know, we all know what happened. Sterling took the weird DQ. Now he's looking. We're gonna we're gonna find out who the real champ is. Um, and we also have the people's main event, Hamza Shemaev taking on Gilbert Burns. And there's a bunch of other good fights on this card, man. So uh, hopefully you enjoy the video. If you do, make sure you leave a like on the video. Leave a comment. Let me know what bets you're making, what bets you might like of mine, which ones you disagree with, whatever. My Twitter's also gonna be in the caption. Hit me up on there, whether it's in the comments or on Twitter. I love going back and forth with you guys. Make sure you leave a like on the video. Absolutely. 12-6 elbow, that subscribe button. And then throw in a legal knee for Piotr Jan on that notifications button so you don't miss the next one. I do breakdowns like this for every single card. I also am dropping DMF Championship videos, which my promotion, DMF Championships, the best UFC 4 and Fight Night players in the world on my Twitch every Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday. So come through. My Twitch is in the caption below if you want to catch that live. We actually have one tonight at 8 p.m. since it is Thursday today. 8 p.m. on Thursday at uh, Eastern Time Zone. We all, best UFC 4, best Fight Night players in the world. It's going to be super fun. Join the Discord if you want to be a part of it. And uh, all that out of the way, man, let's get into this card because had a week off last week and I'm happy to be back. I'm going to let you know right off the bat, these first couple of fights, I'm going to break down pretty, well, not even pretty, very quick because we got to get, I want to spend time on the top cards or the top fights where, you know, one I'm most interested in, you guys are most, most interested in, and it's the ones I'm most likely to bet. For example, first fight of the night, we got Julio Arce taking on Daniel Santos. And the big reason why I'm not super interested in this fight betting-wise, you can't find any goddamn recent footage of this guy santos I, I i could only find a couple of his fights um you know definitely seems like like a solid fighter i mean he's only 27 he seems to be getting better but um they've been trying to book him against you know a couple tough guys obviously the timur valley have got uh fight that was going to be a tough one you know that would have been a pretty crazy debut and then marcelo rojo you know um another tough guy obviously ufc you know they're either believing this guy or they're trying to build, you know, have they ever really tried to build Rojo up? I mean, maybe you could argue for Valia, but, you know, I mean, the guys look pretty legit. The big problem with him is he's just had visa issues and stuff that that's, that slowed down his career. And, um, you know, going into this fight against Julio Arce, I do feel like, you know, he's he finally getting that UFC call. He's, you know, he's obviously, again, had a lot of canceled fights. I, I do think the way this guy fights, he's going to come in, try to take Arce's head completely off. And, you know, um, I just feel like Arce is getting undervalued here because of that last performance. Yeah, he didn't look good against Song Yadong, but that's Song Yadong, man. Song Yadong is an elite-level fighter, you know. And losing to him, yeah, he got finished. It wasn't great, but you look through his last couple of losses, the real bad one for me was the shit. Shaman Marais fight, just because, yeah, it was a split decision, but we did see him, you know, get dropped. We saw him, uh, you know, eat some big shots. Obviously, I mean, I mean, hey, the chin held up, but, you know, losing a dog would do in Song, I don't really like, I don't not, I mean, those are two guys that I feel like would destroy Santos. And, I mean, he just hasn't fought anybody this level. So, you know, without having a ton of tape to go by, we have Arce coming down to 135. He's going to be the bigger guy. He's fought the better fighters. I feel like he can keep it on the outside and just land bigger shots. Um, I feel like he might even have a bit of a grappling advantage here. But I really feel like it's going to play out mostly on the feet with Arce landing just the bigger shots. And this is just a big step up for Santos. So give me Arce. I'm going to go Arce by decision. I do. I think a KO is possible too. I could see him knocking Santos out. Santos gets a little wild. Maybe uh, Arce catch him with something. But I'm going to go Arce by decision. And let's move on to the next fight. Next up, we got Pereira Rodriguez taking on Kay Hansen, and this is going to be even quicker than the last one. I just have no interest in betting this. It's a pick em fight. You know, if it's a fight like this, so low level, women's MMA, I mean, again, respect. They're in the UFC. They deserve nothing but respect, and they can beat up probably every girl you know. But, you know, I like that uh, Kay Hansen's back at 115. I don't think she should be at these up. The, the Jasmine Jazz the Vicious fight, you could clearly tell she was outsized. And if she can't get those... I mean, she had a decent fight with Corey McKenna, but, you know, um, 
the thing is with Kay Anson, good jujitsu, just not great wrestling, and the striking is just wild. She she got that Mackenzie Dern style jujitsu fighter striking where she just she'll wing she'll wing some big shots, but it's just not technical. It's not precise. Pereira's gonna have the more technical, sharp strikes. But can she stay off her back? I've seen her, and I mean, again, not a whole lot of tape you can find on her. But at first, I'm watching tape. I'm like, okay, pretty good gas tank. And then I see her gas on like a round in one of her recent fights. So honestly, I just can't put any trust on her. I mean, yeah, the fight starts on the feet. She's going to have a striking advantage. She's a clear, more like technical striker. But Kansas so green. Her striking's not good at all. But, you know, if she gets a takedown, she could definitely submit Pereira. She doesn't have the greatest ta- uh, grapple. Or, God damn. Ground and pound, K. Hansen. Um, you know, so she kind of needs those submissions. But um, I just feel like overall, at least she does have the takedowns. Um, I will slightly lean K. Hansen. Could I see it being a 15-minute kickboxing sparring match and Pereira just lands the cleaner shot, shots and just jabs her up? Yeah, I could see it. But I'll, I'll, I'll slightly lean K. Hansen to get a takedown or two and edge out the first couple rounds. And, and uh, take the decision. Next up, we got Anthony Hernandez taking on Josh Friend. And this was one where I was starting to get a little, you know, I, I, I really do feel like Josh Friend is probably one of the better underdogs in the card. I mean, obviously there's some big underdogs at the end. But as far as, like, most likely to actually pull off the upset, I mean, got, you know, got knocked out by Gregor Rodriguez, but we've seen that guy. I mean, yeah, he's not known for his punching ability, really. He's more of a grappler, but, I mean, you look at him, he's a brick shit house. If that guy hits you with a flush shot, like, he can knock you out. Other than that, I mean, it, I'm, I've been pretty impressed with this guy. I mean, he had a decently long amateur background, too. Um, seems to be able to mix it up pretty well. Uh, just going into this fight, you know, with Fluffy Hernandez... Obviously, he's mostly known. Got that Armin Guillotine over Adolfo Vieira. Literally the black belt hunter. Shout out to Adolfo Vieira. Got some health problems going on right now. Really just hoping the best for him. Somebody sent me this post. and I'm like, damn. Kind of makes me feel like shit just because I've seen so much people. Like, He's kind of been like just been getting disrespected so hard. Because he's the heavy jiu-jitsu guy and he came in got submitted by like a purple belt. So it's like... You know, not that Pearl Belt is, you know, per, our legit Pearl Belt is extremely high level, but, you know, every UFC fighter's got a black belt. So when you come in and you're the black belt hunter and then a Pearl Belt submits you, you're going to get shit. But, you know, he's got some serious health problems going on. At the end of the day, you got to remember these guys are, you know, warriors. They're literally fighting for entertainment. So, you know, I don't like to disrespect fighters at that point. But, yeah, you know, submitting Adolfo Vieira was impressive. Was it like his jiu-jitsu was so good, or was it, you know, he had Adolfo rocked, he had him completely gassed, but that's what Fluffy does, you know? Um, he's got clean striking, he's got, you know, he, if he catches you, he can put you out, but he's also got submissions. Um, good, you know, he, I mean, look at this, Anika, it is weird that he's been submitted by Marcus Perez, and then just a couple of fights later, submits the black belt hunter, but... Got some good submissions. Got a nasty guillotine, as you can see, at one point three or four in a row. If you include the standing guillotine on Mike Persons, obviously, like the last couple of fights, you've been seeing you know, a mixed bag. But those are pretty decent fighters, man. I mean, and he knocked Jordan Wright out in forty seconds. That he just popped for weed. I mean, Marcus Perez, Jung Young Park, Kevin Holland, Adolfo Vieira. These are people that all better than who Frem's fighting. I mean, besides Gregory Rodriguez. I do think Anthony's going to have the striking advantage. I think he obviously has the experience advantage. Like, yeah, maybe Frem does one extra fight and a couple extra amateur fights, but Hernandez fought the much better competition. I think he should be the favorite. I honestly think this line's right about where... I, I would probably have it like minus 130 Hernandez because I do think Frem is a live dog. I, th- I would not be surprised if he was able to, you know, take him down, avoid the submissions, land some good shots in the feet too. I don't think Hernandez is going to have a huge discrepancy there but i do think he has a slight advantage uh, he's just good at mixing it up so i'm gonna go anthony hernandez and i'm gonna go hernandez god the path of victory i really can't or the the uh you know method of victory is is really tough with hernandez i i would typically see sub but uh i just i don't know if he'll get friend but i'll probably go decision uh hernandez but it, it, you know it could go a lot of ways um Actually, yeah, I am going to go with the submission. I'm going to go Anthony Hernandez by sub, second round. Next up, we go Alexi Alaniak. Alaniak taking on Jared Vandera. Alaniak might be the oldest fighter in the UFC. If not, he's like the second or third. I believe he is the oldest fighter in the UFC with Mario Renault retired now. But uh, 59 wins, 16 losses, and a draw. No contest. Um, Jared Vandera, 
you know, uh, a big ask. I mean, I saw some people pointing out on Twitter, Alexi was supposed to fight probably the smallest heavyweight in the division. And uh, fucking, oh, wow. Um, supposed to fight him last week when um, uh, Alir Latifi, like literally 5'8 heavyweight. Alir Latifi is lifted at like 5'10 and he's not. Now, oh, he's out. We're going to give you a guy 50 pounds bigger and like a foot taller. Here's Jan Vandera. Now, the one thing that works for him is Vandera has no takedown defense, man. No takedown defense. That height works against him when people get on, in on his legs. If you want to take him down, you can. And Alexi is going to want to take him down. The only thing is, man, Alenix 44, and he looks it in the octagon. And he really, really looks like 54 in the octagon. The man has about three minutes to go hard, and then he is with him. And, I mean, the striking is so wild. Vandera, never typically the more technical striker as I take a dab. Shout out to the DMF. Come through tonight, 8 p.m. Eastern. Watch the fights. <laughs> First half of the day. <coughs> it'll get you. It'll get you. <coughs> All right, fine. I took one right before I started this video. But the second half of the day, I'll get you too. <coughs> but it's not often you'll hear Van Der might be <coughs> the more technical striker because his striking's not great. But he's got... <coughs> and another thing to note is they actually have the same reach, even though he's 6'4". I mean, not that Alexi, you know, listed as 6'2", pretty tall himself, but... 80 inch reach, man. That is a long reach. But <laughs> he doesn't like throw jabs, man. This man just tries to club you. <coughs> I mean, that is the best way to describe Alenia striking. He just tries to club your head off. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really going to be for me. Like, he's got to get that submission. He's got to get Bandera down and submit him. And I'm going to say that he does get him down and submit him. I'm going to go Alenia. I'm going to go Alenia by sub. Um, if he doesn't get that submission, it's gonna get really fucking sloppy. Unless Van Der can catch him, but he just doesn't have a lot of power for a heavyweight. I mean, he's still a heavyweight, he's still 265 pounds. If he catches Alenic with a flush right hand, he can put him out, but it's just not what he does. We'll see, though. I just don't. Uh, I, <coughs> and I'm not betting on this fight, by the way. I just like. He's a slight, slight underdog, and even at his age. I just feel like, I mean, this is a 50-50 fight, man. Like, I'm not going to be, I, I get why he's the favorite. The man is fucking 15 years younger. And yeah, it's heavyweight, but Aleniak looks his age. And I, he's got a fucking couple minutes. And I'm, I might be picking, since I'm not betting it, I might be picking this a little bit with my heart. I'm not going to lie. I love I love the boa constrictor Aleniak. I'm trying not to, but really, this is like a straight up pass, man. It, it could go either way. I, I'm going to slightly 51% out of 100. Did I have to say out of 100 there? I don't know. Sorry. Dad hit me quick, quick I guess. I'm saying dumb shit. But, like, the slightest of leans, Alenia, to get a takedown, probably get a submission there, or just hold him for a round and a half, slightly edge the second, and then just don't die in the third. But I will say Vandera's going to have a big guess, a big uh, cardio advantage, and... The striking advantage is there, too, especially after three minutes when Aleniak is gassed, mouth-breathing. <coughs> Next up, we got Mickey Gall taking on Mike Malott. And, uh, you know, this is a weird fight, man. It's weird seeing Mickey Gall come in as an underdog to a guy that probably, you know, none of you all are watching this right now know. I mean, Mike Malott coming in, he doesn't have a lot of tape you can find either, man. There's, there's several fights in this card that don't. Um, you know, coming off a couple of decent wins. You know, he had the guillotine in the first round in the contender series, which got him here. Submission in the first round before that. I mean, the guy's definitely got some some good jujitsu. His striking doesn't look bad. I mean, his loss there, he got finished by Hakeem with Dabudu. I mean, we know how good Dabudu is. Um, you know, I, I've liked what I've seen so far from a lot. You know, uh, decent Canadian prospect right now. And then over at Alpha Male, um, you know, I, I do feel like on the feet it's gonna be pretty competitive i do feel like man as much as people like to shit on mikey mickey gall he actually his striking has gotten better i mean until he gassed like he gasses in every fight he, he was 
<laughs> this is such a disgusting statement that I'm ashamed of, but he was out boxing Mike Perry. Not that that means much, but he was. And then Mike Perry started wrestling him. And Morono? Morono's legit, man. I knew Morono. I mean, I had a good amount of money on Morono going into that one. And, uh, but this is just a different matchup where I do feel like Mickey Gall can be competitive on the feet. And, you know, while Malat's jiu-jitsu has looked solid, his grappling looks solid, I think it's going to be tough for Gall to be able to take him down. I do feel like on the mat, the jiu-jitsu is going to be pretty close too. And I wouldn't be shocked if Mickey Gall could get to his back and submit him. I mean, this isn't a fight, like, I mean, at the end of the day, am I trying to bet a fate? Like, if I was, I guess it'd be over a guy like Mickey Gall, who I've always, you know, kind of been very low on, been looking to fade. The only time I didn't fade him was in the Jordan Williams fight, and I'm glad I didn't because fucking, you know, he won. But, um, you know, I've, I've never been a believer in Mickey Gall. They brought him in solely to get beat up. Well, to give CM Punk a chance to not look terrible. And, uh, you know, obviously, we saw how that worked out. But since then, you know, it's just it's just not been good, man. He's trying to learn on the job, so I can't, like, knock the guy. But he was signed to the UFC at 1-0. Like, he was fucked from the beginning. Because the UFC, this is not Bellator. This, they, they don't have, like, they can give you Mike Malat and try... To either, I mean, at this point, really, the UFC saying shit or get off the pot. We're gonna give you this young, up and coming guy. Not that Malat's crazy young. I mean, thirty, but plenty of time still. At welterweight, you still got a solid five years till you're in your prime for a welterweight. But um, you know, um, I just feel like the UFC's like, all right, either this new guy gets the win, gets a little hype off Gall, nothing crazy, but a little bump, or Gall, you know, this is somebody who's potentially beatable. It's just a close fight. I'm not trying to lay minus 180 on a guy who, you know, I just haven't seen a lot from. I haven't seen him fight, you know, anybody of note, really, especially beat anybody of note. I mean, we saw he lost to Hakeem, but... So, it'd be dog or pass for me. I'm going to still pick, it, at betting-wise, that is. I'll pick Mike Malat to win a decision, make you call to stick in there, but, uh, um, you know, lose a three-round decision. But, um, you know... Value's probably on Gall because I'm just not betting minus 180 on a guy with eight fights. Not that Gall has much other, but much more either. But eight fights and none of them in the UFC. It's just that's tough. Next up, we got Aspen Ladd taking on Raquel Pennington. And um, man, I'm not gonna lie, two girls that I don't know. Even though Raquel, you could say on a three fight winning streak. Um, yeah, I just I've never. I just well, I won't say never. I haven't been like super high on her lately and it's not because you know when you go through her fights um it's not like she's only losing the elite you know oh like you can't knock any of these losses holly holm duranda man duranda me amanda nunez holly holm again jessica andrage like and then you got to go all the way back to 2013 for cats and gano and leslie smith that one in 2012 <coughs> like typically she beats all the girls that aren't like the elite of the elite. It's just, I just haven't loved how she's been looking, you know, even in some of these wins. It's just, I mean, the last one obviously worked out pretty good for her, but the two before that, I just wasn't super impressed. Just looked kind of stale. The good thing for her is Aspen Ladd just, just not looked good either, man. And I mean, in, the, in her last fight, came in over Norma Dumont. I had money on Norma Dumont. I had a feeling it was going to play out like that. It was a terrible fight, but Dumont... I mean, just two girls. I mean, Dumont had a slight grappling advantage. She's bigger and stronger, and she just used it. And, you know, we saw... we Another thing, this is back down at uh, 135, and fucking Aspen Ladd has just never been able to really make this weight very well. Um, Raquel used to make it all the time. So this is Raquel's typical division, but Aspen... You know, last time she made this division, she got knocked out in like 10 seconds by Duran Durandame. So you want to watch weigh-ins for this one for sure. Um, definitely watch weigh-ins for this one because they're probably going to be bringing out the box of shame for our girl Aspen. And outside of that, man, she's had knee injuries. She's had surgeries, like some serious injuries. Uh, and this just is the type of girl that Raquel would typically be. We think of Raquel as older as she older than she is, and fight wise, she's getting up there, <coughs> like fight age. But man, you know, 
I feel like this is the type of matchup where Raquel tends to shine. I mean, you know, I'd put her right in there with the Macy Case on Pandy Kianza. Marlon, Mar- I mean, Marion Renault is more skilled. She's just old. Irene Aldana, Misha Tate, like, these are girls that are as skilled as Aspen Ladd, I feel like. And, the, and you know, Raquel goes in there and shows that she's just a little bit above them. She's There is levels. So I do feel like this is Raquel. Like the striking is going to be competitive. I feel like Raquel can put her up against the cage, just be the stronger girl. I feel like Raquel's going to have the better gas tank, the just better, like, will. Even if Aspen gets a takedown, gets on top, she, like, I just, I don't know. Raquel is just a savvy veteran and yeah her record's starting to get a little salty i mean she is on a three fight win streak right now whether you agree with a couple of them or not uh but like people knock raquel are really quick to shit on raquel but i really feel like this is going to be one of those levels fights not that it's going to be dominant but you're going to be like it's going to be a clear winner i, I think raquel is going to take the decision here i mean even if it gets a little greasy i just feel like raquel is going to be able to do what it, she needs to do to squeeze out two of these rounds so I'm going to go Raquel by decision. I know a lot of people like Aspen as a dog, but I'm going to go Raquel by decision. I just, two girls I typically look to fade, at least like, you know, I mean, not in Raquel's last couple of fights because they haven't really gave her a fav- fadeable matchup, but I mean, again, they're not, I, I, apparently they like Raquel. They don't like it. They didn't like that string of fucking, you know, Holly Holm, Amanda Nunes, <laughs> But uh, next up, we got Jar. I, mean, I will take Raquel by decision. Next up, we take we got R- Jarzinho Rosenstruck taking on Marcin Tybura. And this is a weird one, man. This this one is weird for me. You know, Rosenstruck, <coughs> kickboxer. Um, obviously lost the last decision to Curtis Blades. Did a lot of staring. Uh, beat a, a Sakai with the second left in the first round. Beat Alistair Overeem with a couple seconds left in the fifth round. Um stared had a staring match with Cyril Gaon and Blades lost those um you know ca- it's basically either catches you and knocks you out or he, you know he just doesn't throw and loses at least since he's come to the UFC I mean he, he caught JDS Sakai and Alistair over him and the other three oh and the Francis one you know Francis says stupid I wasn't gonna give you the chance and just literally bum rushed him but his other two fights just two staring matches Ty Burra, you know, in his losses, we've seen him get finished, you know. It was finished by Sakai, was finished by Shamil, finished by Derek Lewis, was finished again by uh, Stefan Puitz, and I, I thought there was one more. Maybe I'm tripping. Um, but, uh, yeah, four times. Um, in the Volkov fight, I know people, like, all week this week I've been hearing people on, on Twitter saying, oh, well, you saw what Aspinall did to Volkov. And, I mean, one, Aspinall's super legit. Two, it's like, okay, like, he caught him, and he caught him under the submission. Like, it's not like Volkov is a bad fighter. Aspinall is heavyweight, and he caught him, and I, you know, and then he got the arm bar. I mean, I don't think, like, Volkov is, people are so ready to just write him off. They're like, oh, well, that win doesn't, or that loss is way worse now. It's like, I think Volkov is still pretty damn legit. It's just Aspinall is legit, too, man. And it's heavyweight division. Shit can happen. You make one mistake. But I just feel like Rosenstruck, man, it's like he's a favorite and he has one way to win. Yeah, we've seen Ty Burr get knocked out. Um, and yeah, like Rosenstruck's going to be a little bit bigger. He's going to have a little bit of size on Ty Burr, But I don't know, man. I just feel like Ty Burr can out-volume him to a decision on the feet. I feel like if it turns into a staring match, he wins that low-volume affair. He could get a couple takedowns. We've seen Rosenstruck is, you know, he just doesn't have shit off his back. Um, we could see Ty Burra knock him out. I think Ty Burra just has more pass to victory. He's the underdog. And I just, I know Rosenstruck got that big power, but, like, it, he has, he literally has to land the knockout shot. And I get it. He could definitely do it. And then y'all will be like, oh, I fucking told you. Oh, why would you bet Ty Burra? But... Fucking, I don't know, man. I'd like to go with the people with more pass to victory. Um, you know, like, I just feel like, like, over long term, you know, if you're if you're making bets and you're constantly going with the person with the puncher's chance, you're probably typically losing money. I just, um, you know, I mean, obviously, as I try to load it, load into my bets real quick for after this, but... Um, you know, 
like sometimes there's there's exceptions, but in general, it's like Rosenstruck has to just find the big shot, and knock him out. Otherwise, Ty Burrow's gonna win pretty easily. I mean, uh, so I like Ty Burrow, and I also took a I wanted to take Ty Burrow by decision, but instead. I split it up, and I have Ty Burrow as an underdog, and then I also have fight to go to decision because nobody thinks it is. I got big plus money, um, plus 160 uh, on the fight to go to decision. I, I think, you know, if Rosenstruck doesn't nuke him, it's going to go to decision. I think Ty Burrow will grind him out. Um, I think, yeah, obviously there is, a, like, a chance Rosenstruck could nuke him or Ty Burrow could even knock him out as heavyweight, but... I think it could either be, I think more likely it's either a slow, you know, heavyweight staring contest like two of, like the Blades and a gone fight for Rosenstruck or Ty Burrow lands a couple takedowns and then on the feet Rosenstruck's just looking for the knockout blow and he can't get it. So Ty Burrow plays it smart. He's been knocked out four times. I get it could happen, but I think he's going to, those knockouts are going to make him a little cautious against the guy who can only win by knockout. He doesn't throw volume. So... I got Ty Burra. I got fight to go to decision. I got a third dab. Next up, we got Ian Gary taking on Darian Weeks. And, uh, <coughs> you know, early on, <laughs> I was really eyeing this as an underdog, Darian Weeks. Um, decent wrestling we saw in the Brian Barberana fight. He was taking him down at will. But the thing is, man, Brian Barberina gets taken down every fight. You know, I mean, uh, that's just reality. So I tried to go through some more of his fights. And, you know, the wrestling's not bad. The striking's not bad. He's decent everywhere. You know, he's decent. Um, thing is, man, I really do think that the UFC pinpointed this matchup because they're obviously trying to build Ian Gary, you know, their little... Conor McGregor too. He really needs to stop bringing up Conor McGregor in his interviews because it's just cringy when he constantly is like, "Oh, Conor McGregor, you know, well, oh, you like Conor McGregor." It's like, dude, let other people make the comparisons. Don't do it for them. It just makes it cringe. Anyways, I wasn't super impressed with either of these guys' debut. I mean, Darian Weeks, yeah, I get it, it was a, you know that's a tough tough debut. Even if Bear Barbarina is getting up there and isn't as he used to be. I mean, he's a ton of experience on him. But still, it's like, you know, got the takedowns, wasn't able to do enough with it. The striking didn't look great. Ian Gary's getting clipped up on the feet by Jordan Williams. Um, you know, obviously eventually got the knockout, but, you know, it was looking sketchy before then. And I do think Darian Weeks can take him down. Um, the thing is, I just don't know if he can keep taking him down. And... After watching Weeks fight, I don't think he has the the danger on the feet that, that Jordan Williams does. I get Jordan Williams, you know, the defense ended up costing him there and getting him knocked out. But overall, like, his hands aren't, you know, terrible. I think he's got better boxing than Darian Weeks. Um, could Weeks catch him? Yeah. Could he take him down? Yes. I think he will land probably a takedown. I uh, wouldn't be shocked unless Gary catches him early. But, you know... At this point, I think the line's too wide. I did get Gary at like minus 210, minus 220, something like that, early in the week. Or like, not even early in the week, I mean like last week. Might even been a week and a half ago. Yeah, it was... Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Damn it, which uh, I'm trying to remember what book I did that on. Oh, here we go. Yeah, minus 225. Minus 225. Um, you know, I, 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 I see some place sat at as low as one minus 180. Wow. If you got in on it that early, I do think you got on the right side because at the end of the day, I just don't know if you can have faith in Darian to go in here and secure takedowns for two rounds. I think you can get a takedown or two, but I just feel like Gary on the feet, there's a striking advantage there. Is it striking like Conor McGregor already? No, it's not. But you know, it is a bit ahead of Darian Weeks, and I just feel like the UFC made this matchup for a reason. I feel like a striking advantage is going to be a little bit too much. He's going to catch Weeks. I'm going to go Ian Gary, first round knockout. Next up, we got Vince Michelle taking on Mark Madsen. And uh, this is a pretty interesting fight, man, because you got uh, Vince Michelle, who, you know, both these guys 
I have good wrestling. I mean, Vince Pichel is defensive wrestling. Like, his takedown defense hasn't been great. But, you know, he gets takedowns in his fights. Obviously, in this fight, though, is he going to be able to take Mark Madsen down? Eh, probably not. Unless Mark Madsen is to get super tired, I don't see that happening. Because Mark Madsen, the Olympian, silver medalist in the, in, uh, the Wrestling Olympics, um, you know, both these guys a little bit up there for lightweights, you know, 39 to 37. Mark Madsen's only 11 to 0 for being, you know, both these guys are don't fight a ton, you know. P- Pichel's kind of known for the same thing, you know. He's 39, but he he only has 16 fights and you know, yeah, he only really fights like typically like once a year and It was either sound nasally for the rest of the video or blow my nose. But um Mark Madsen, you know, uh the thing with him is you just haven't seen the cardio. Like, the cardio just has not looked great. And you have seen it, and it hasn't looked great. And, you know, Pichelle, on the other hand, great cardio. Now, not good takedown defense, so I think uh, Madsen will be able to take him down early. But, you know, uh, is he going to be able to do that for two full rounds? Like... Maybe, but that end of that second is going to start getting dicey if he's just shooting the whole time. And the thing is, it's like, yeah, he's going to be able to take Pichelle down, but can he hold him down? Because if he can't hold him down, he has to keep shooting. <coughs> he's going to gas out even faster. And his top control doesn't look like we see guys getting taken down by him, but then they get back up and he has to shoot again. He has to shoot again. And he's not just like tripping guys or, you know, getting low. You know, like he's having to use like he's picking dudes up and slamming you and he's using that Greco Roman wrestling and that that's very tiring and I, I could see him getting tired. And on the feet, you know, Pichelle is gonna have a slight striking advantage. Mark Madsen, you know I, I it, it is getting better, you know, his jab is improved. He, he's using it in his last fight, but I just feel like Pichelle with his leg kicks, uh Madsen doesn't really know how to check him. We like, we've seen him eat leg kicks before. And then the gas tank, my cardio kills. This is a super 50-50 fight. I do feel like Madsen's going to take him down. But, man, that last fight, it's like, if if that's how it looked against Clay Guida, I get Clay Guida as the cardio king, too. But michelle has got great cardio, too. And I don't know. I feel like his striking is a little bit better. He's just a little bit better at just getting it done and winning rounds than Clay Guida at this point. And, uh, man, I am going to slightly lean Vince Pichel. This is a close one, man. It's tough to bet against Madsen knowing that he's going to be able to take Vince down. But it's also tough to bet Madsen knowing he's going to get tired. Because I just he never can just take dudes down one time and hold them. They're always constantly getting up. And if he has to keep taking Pichel down, if he has to shoot damn near 10 takedowns on Pichel, he's going to get tired, man. So I'm going to go Pichel. I'm going to go Pichel by decision. I don't have any bets on that fight, but... I think, uh, I think he's a slight favorite for a reason. Next up, we got Mackenzie Dern taking on Tisha Torres. And you are starting to see that line swing. You had Mackenzie Dern as the as the favorite um, really up until, I think, this morning. Um, maybe, yes, maybe la- last night. But, uh, you know, all week, you know, I was just really, spoiler alert, trying to decide how much I wanted to put on Torres. At the end of the day, man, we got Dern, jiu-jitsu specialist. But we saw the flaw in that last fight, not that we didn't already know it. You know, yeah, she looked good once she got Marina down, but she couldn't find the sub. And if she can't find that sub, man, it's just tough. I mean, yeah, against Jan but she took a decision, but that's against another specialist. Those are two jujitsu specialists. Uh, you know, in this fight, it's like Tisha Torres is a veteran. She's a veteran, man. And, like, yeah, she had four losses in a row at one point to who? Jessica Andrade, she beat Dern, especially in 2018. Oh, Joanna? She'd beat her, too, in 2018. Oh, Zhang, she'd beat her, too, especially in 19. Oh, Marina, already beat her. So it's like, you gotta, it's, you can't just look at wins and losses. Torres is a veteran. She's fought all the best girls in the division. She's also 5'1", with a 61-inch reach. She's got, it's hard to get under people like that. Like, I know from first-hand experience, when they're tall, when they're short like that, yeah, if you're tall, it can help with the wrestling and the clinch and, like, you know, if you're good at, like, picking an ankle, 
oh, you can use your reach that way, or, or the body locks and the clinch. But overall, man, wrestling helps. The takedowns help when, when you're shorter. You can that, Those long legs work against you. And Dern already has problems getting takedowns. She had like a 0% takedown uh, percentage uh, like until like maybe a fight ago. Um, or like 8% or some shit. She had literally gotten like one takedown. She literally has almost always has to pull guard or just hope that a girl follows her to the mat. And she takes advantage of these girls' low IQ. And I know I'm getting a little crazy with the dabs. I'm probably wrecking y'all's ears with the torch. But, you know, I don't know. It's here and the wax looking cute. Whoops. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. Anyways. On the feet is Tisha all day, man. Dern, like I said earlier, <coughs> she throws those clubbing shots. The striking has gotten better, you know. The hands have gotten better. She does have power, but Torres has seen power, and she throws her hands are twice as fast. She throws twice the volume. She can mix it up. Her strikes into her takedowns. Is she gonna want to take Dern down? No, but she can clinch her up a little bit. Now she's gonna watch when she clinches Dern. Dern to just fall back and pull guard, but. Torres is so strong, man. The tiny tornado is right. Like, she puts her head on your chest, blasts a couple punches, puts you up against the cage, <laughs> separates, couple punches, head kick. <coughs> She's just so much faster. Striking advantage, speed advantage, power is probably pretty damn close, honestly. She's gonna still probably be stronger, even if she's a little bit smaller than Dern. Um, she's strong as hell. And, uh,. I just don't think even if Dern gets a takedown, I don't think Tor is just gonna be submitted like that. Like, man, also it's like it's hard to fucking submit them little compact, especially when you only got a couple minutes, you get them down, the punches are involved. It's like it's a little harder, man. Get get that limb, those sixty one inch reach, like she's like so short and compact with good jujitsu. Like those are tough tough people to submit. And um uh, you know, um Tora's just seen it all, man. She's so experienced. She's huge speed advantage. Her huge experience advantage. Huge speed advantage. Huge striking advantage. So I got Tora's all day. I got her as an underdog. It was like plus one ten. Um, I I bet her. I bet that. I believe. Um, I, be, I, I should have probably looked at this before, but I believe. Boom 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 boom. Yeah, I also took the fight to go to decision. Um, minus 150. I mean, I just really... I think Torres wins the decision. I already had money. I knew that line was going to uh, drop on Torres. Um, I knew she was going to end up being a favor when the smart money came in. So I wanted to hurry up and get that in. And, uh, you know, I, instead of taking just the over, I wanted the full fight to go to decision. <coughs> so I just split them up. I got a, oh, it looks like actually Dern is the favorite on some books. Yeah, never mind. Okay. Uh, I was going off Tapology's word because, um, you know, I, I really did feel like it was going to swing. But apparently, no. Um, on most of these books, Mackenzie Dern is a slight favorite, like minus 110. Um, or, I mean, like minus 115. Minus 110, minus 110 on some books, whatever. But, yeah, I mean, you can get Torres uh, as an underdog still. And, I mean, Jesus, I just... I just don't see it, man. Obviously, it could be a close fight. Obviously, Dern could catch a sub, but I got Torres by decision, um, and I bet that already. Next up, we got we're getting into that top three. Though these crazy fights, the people's main event next: Gilbert Burns taking on Hamza Shemaev, probably the biggest prospect in MMA right now. One of the biggest prospects we've ever had in MMA, to be honest. Uh, the Wolf Boars, Hamza Shemaev. Huge favorite. He's like six to one. Um, you know, almost twenty eight. Gilbert Burns almost thirty six. Um, he's gonna have a big size advantage here. We saw him. This was a big thing that made a big. You know, th this was something big for me. And I'm gonna. I, I'm sorry, but these these fights got me lit, and I gotta take another one. We're getting a little crazy. Betting video. This might be a record. This is like six, seven dabs. You know, if this was my stream, this ain't shit. But I'm sorry. Anyways, big thing for me, we saw Hamza Shemaev get into a wrestling match with Jack Hermanson. 
<coughs> he made Jack Hermanson look small. I mean, it was pretty crazy. I wanted to see if they had put the actual score on here. But, um, you know, he beat Jack Hermanson, who's a big-ass middleweight. Like, he's a big middleweight. <coughs> he makes other <coughs> middleweights look small a lot of times. And Hamza made him look small. Now, I get, like, his height makes it, like, worse. Like, he, like you know, he's not the thickest guy. But he's not skinny, man. This guy's pretty fucking big, dude. And he's gonna have a... And Gilbert Burns, yeah. They made him bump up to welterweight because... I remember he had a fight in California. And I think he was the first person ever in the UFC to get denied. Like, they literally... They did the, they did the little water retention test or whatever and they said that he had cut too much weight and they canceled his fight and i think he was like the first ufc fighter to that, that they did that to um so yeah he was a big lightweight but like frame that's like uh, he just doesn't have the biggest frame like i don't just mean height i just mean like they stand next to each other he's not like crazy thicker than hamza like and hamza man yeah it says five ten six two i swear i don't know if Burns only like five nine and Hamza or, or or Hamza's like six three, but man, there looks like there might even be it might be more than four inches. Like he looks just so much bigger, man. This is the guy that made a big ass middleweight look small against a guy who used to make lightweight. Hamza Shamayev couldn't make lightweight if his life depended on it. Okay, like he couldn't, he would die. Big size advantage here. Size, like size doesn't always matter. Size matters when the skill is close, like. Skill, uh, two UFC fighters, like, there's weight advantage, or weight divisions for, for for a reason. And you got, like, a weight in a division and a half on, on Burns here for Hamza. Outside, especially it matters when it's two grapplers. Yeah, Hamza's got hands. Yeah, Burns got hands. But at the end of the day, these dudes are grapplers. Hamza is a, still a wrestler at the end of the day. And Burns is a jiu-jitsu guy at the end of the day. Two grapplers. You got two grapplers and one is a division and a half bigger than the other guy. Okay, as a grappler, I know what that like what that tends to typically look like. If the guys are close. Like I submit guys double or you know, twice my size every day. But if they're as good as me, it's gonna be tough. You know what I mean? Like if they're as good as me, it's gonna I'm gonna be on defense from the beginning. And I like you gotta have some advantages. You gotta get them tired, you gotta work through, you gotta be a lot quicker. This guy like but I don't know if I see a lot of that from Burns. Like, I, I'm just, I don't, I like Burns a lot. But like, at the end of the day, man, I've always been a little skeptical because it's like, okay, I love Wonder Boy, one of the fucking absolute legend, and you y'all know he's my boy. But you know, grinding Wonder Boy out, you know, like yeah, do what you got to do. Y'all know me. I, I'm all about use your strengths against their weaknesses. Um, but like grinding Wonder Boy to a decision like that, um. Two to one decision, um, I you know at this point in Wonder Boy's career, and then you know outside of that he beat Tyron Woodley who literally couldn't win a round at that point of his career, and like these are three forty year olds right here, like, and y'all know like, I'm a fan of Tyron Woodley you know Wonder Boy is my boy one of my favorite fucking UFC fighters, cause that's my homie but you know and then before that Gunnar Nelson like. Who was like one foot in, one foot out of fighting? Like uh, that was his biggest win. Before then, Konchenko, Mike Davis, that was the last person he submitted somebody. You know, uh, OAM. Like he doesn't have a lot of impressive wins, and and we're talking about lightweight back then. Like this, those aren't even welterweight fights. Uh, you know, like Gilbert Burns. What's his most impressive welterweight win? It's probably Gunnar Nelson. I mean, I guess you could say what? Gunnar Nelson or what? It's either out of 40-year-old Woodley who couldn't win around or 40-year-old Damian Maya, who's one of my favorite fighters. But, like, at the end of the day, man, he was past it. And, oh, like, worst matchup ever. Oh, you're a fucking 40-year-old jiu-jitsu, strictly jiu-jitsu guy? We're going to give you a world championship jiu-jitsu guy who's fucking 10 years younger than you and has better, like, way better striking. <laughs> like, what? That was the worst matchup ever. Like, I had a bunch of money on Burns, and it broke my heart. But, you know, in this fight, I just, you know, 
I just again, what are Burns' big wins at welterweight? Like, I guess it's probably I would put the Maya win probably. I don't even know. I mean, stylistically no. So I guess Woodley's his best win. Woodley who lost like fucking fifteen rounds in a row and then got knocked out by Jake Paul after that. Like, I know that that last one doesn't matter, but still, it has to be said. Um, you know, Hamza Shemaev, like I get it. Should he be six to one? No, Burns is legit, but like. You gotta look at it for what the fight is, and the UFC knows what's up. Burns shouldn't be at welterweight. At the, I mean, he should be at 165. That's the shit. He's a big ass lightweight. He either have to straight up lose muscle, or but like, I, it's tough, man. He's a betweener. But Shamayev will be at middleweight in a couple years if he's still fighting, unless he does another reti- stint with retirement. We'll see him at middleweight. Burns. Is a small welterweight, and we got on the feet. I need to, you know, I can't say that enough, but on the feet, you know, I Shamaya, we haven't seen like a ton. There's a lot of question marks, but you know, uh, he's got hands, he's got power. Um, Burns has power too, but you know, I just feel like Shamaya's gonna be able to use his reach, use his height on the feet, set land good shots. We've seen Burns' chin get tested a couple times. I'm not saying he's chinny, I'm seeing, you know. We haven't seen Shamayev's chin get busted like that. We see him barely even get hit. We've seen Burns get busted. I just, you know, I I get it. And if you're taking Burns, I get it. Because the fucking line is too wide at this point. But at the end of the day, man, like, I don't have any money on this fight. uh, Because the line is just too wide and I just can't bet against like against burns six to one really like, with anybody in the welterweight division but i also can't find myself to bet burns because i really just don't see him winning this fight um i guess he'd, he'd probably have to catch Hamza and knock him out so if you're taking burns i'd honestly take him i mean yeah you could just take him inside the distance on the chance he submits him but because obviously like that's always a path of victory with burns but I don't really see him submitting him. I think he's going to be on his back. Unless he could get to Shamayev's back. But I, I think Burns, is, I meant he's going to be on his back. Like, Shamayev's going to be on top when they grapple. I don't see him submitting Shamayev off his back. But he'd have to take Shamayev's back and Rene could choke him or something. I just don't see it happening. I'm going to go Shamayev, TKO, second round. Um, or, yeah, pro- probably TKO, second round. As tough as that is to say, like, I love Burns. I just, I do feel like Shamaya is going to roll here. So, I'm going to go Shamaya to get this win and fight Usman. And we'll see. Uh, we'll see. I won't be betting him at no fucking favorite odds against Usman, man. If y'all y'all do some dumbass shit like this against Usman, then I will be taking y'all's money. Um. But I will go Shamayev second round TKO. Let's go into the first title fight of the fight or of the night. We got Aljamain Sterling taking on Piotr Jan. I'm not even gonna say Aljamain Sterling the champion. Like they're both the champ. Let's see who the real champ is after this. Piotr Jan, I think he's one of the best pound for pound fighters in the UFC in the world. Um, he's so clean, man. His boxing's so good. He rarely gets hit clean. When he does, his chin has looked, you know. So good. Um, you know, his losses, you know, the DQ, and then he did not lose this fight. I've watched it twice now. He did not lose that fight. It was a bullshit decision. Um, he's really undefeated, man. And I, you know, really, like, if anything, the only problem we've seen with him is, is he doesn't always throw a ton of volume. We actually saw Corey Sanhagen in his last fight outland him in four of the five rounds. But, you know, Jan just landed the bigger shots and he does have so much power that he can make up for it a lot of times because he knocks you down. He gets a lot of knockdowns, man. If Another fight that people don't remember is the Jimmy Rivera fight, man. Jimmy Rivera was winning both the first two rounds. And in both the first two rounds, Jimmy Rivera controlled the whole round and then got knocked down at the end. And that's how Jan won the fight. It was just with knockdowns. But, you know, he doesn't always throw the most volume. He likes to look for his perfect shot. And, uh, you know, that can lose him rounds sometimes as I go into that eight. In the first fight, we saw, well, first of all, Aljo, 
high volume, and the first fight too much. We'll get into that. <coughs> really good jujitsu, Sarah jujitsu, Mad Sarah, you know, black belt. <coughs> the back belt, or the backpacker, pack kid, you know. Sorry, I can't talk. I'm a little snu- stuffy today, if you can't tell. Um, if this guy gets to your back, we saw against Corey, especially if he gets to your back when you're dry and early, he's going to finish you, man. This guy's really good jujitsu, But in the first fight, he just could not get Yarn down. In the end, it was Yarn getting the takedowns, tripping Alderman at will, throwing him. Man, he big brother at Sterling. But I do think that was largely due to Sterling coming out too hot in that first round. In the first round, Sterling put a pace on that he could not keep up. And we saw him completely gas out. And then it, we saw him getting thrown around. Would he have been getting thrown around that bad if he wasn't so gassed? I don't know. But did he pick up such a pace? Because when he got in there, he was like, holy shit. Like, I got to, like, you know, people say, oh, why'd that guy go so crazy? He can't sustain that. Because when you're fighting, I know firsthand, bro. When you're in there, and just through sparring. If I'm sparring a guy who's so much better than me, and he's rocking the shit out of me, you put up a higher pace because you're just trying to fucking survive. Like, literally, you're just like, double leg, double leg. You know, fucking Aljo was coming in with, like, fucking quadruple jabs. Fucking into a shot, into a fucking clinch attempt. Try, like, just going nuts. But that's the type of shit you do when you start panicking a little bit. And did he panic or was that the game plan? I don't know. It's it's hard to say, especially when Aljo, you know, he's kind of taking on this troll, um, and you know, troll, and he he t- he steps out of it here and there. He's openly sad in the lead up because you can tell the hate kind of bothers him a little bit. He says like, you saw my reaction after the fight. I didn't want the belt like that. But then you know, if you guys are gonna you know, like do me like this, basically, then I'm gonna run with it. He probably did the smart thing, but unfortunately, like the price to pay with that is the fans. I mean, eh, he's probably no not probably he's the most hated champion right now like hands down one of the most hated champions probably ever in ufc history and i do think people are getting a little that because of that people are like man all people forget aldra was the favorite in the first fight i get we saw this fight already and it, it, it wasn't going good for him but you know these are elite level fighters he was fighting for the belt for a reason don't underestimate a professional athlete, a professional fighter's ability to make adjustments. I do have Piotr Jan. I do. I am going to go with Piotr Jan. I think he probably does finish Sterling via TKO. But would I be shocked if Sterling comes in more patient, doesn't go nuts in the first round, and then finds an opening, gets the Jan's back, gets to, and Rinnega chokes him? I would not be shocked. I would not be shocked. Sterling is 20 and 3 and was fighting for the belt for a reason. He's one of the best 135ers in the world. I do think Jan is the best 135er in the world and one of the best fighters in the world, pound for pound. So I think Jan will win. But minus 500, I think it is at this point. Little sketchy, man. A little sketchy when you're going against a guy who at any point, if he gets to your back, it's over. Matt Sarah Black Belt. You know, um... I'm going to go Jan. I'm going to go Jan to pick up where he left off last time. I do think he'll start off a little faster this time because typically he likes to start slow and make reads. Obviously, he's already made the reads on Aljo. They fought already. He's going to be able to pick up a little bit where he left off. But he'll he'll know Aljo's going to make adjustments, so he'll still probably be measured early. But because they've had a fight before, I do think he'll come in a little, little bit more aggressive early. I don't know if he'll just drop the first two rounds like I thought he did in the last one. Um, but... I'm going to go Piotr Jan. I'm going to go Jan, third round TKL. Let's move on to the next one. Main event time. If you made it this far, I appreciate you. You're goaded. You made it through all the dabs, so you might as well get one more. Dab nine. Alexander Volkanovsky, the champ, one of the best featherweights of all time, taking on Chan Sung Jung, the Korean zombie, a a fan favorite. A lot of people know, one of the best fighters in the world. He was forced to go to the military because in Korea, 
every man has to do two two years of military service. So in the height of his career, he had to leave for that. He came back and he's had some good wins. <coughs> I mean, uh, came back, knocked out Dennis Bermudez, and then uh, fought Yair and was winning the fight. Man, it's one of the most insane knockouts of all time because he had the fight won, and then with one second in the fight. Eats one of the craziest spinning, or not spinning, back elbows ever. Or it was like a little, like, up elbow. Or, yeah, no, 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 it was behind the back elbow from Yair. And fucking knocked him out cold. And then put together a couple good wins. I mean, the Frankie fight, I just feel like Frankie's past it. He was so much bigger than Frankie. And there's a lot going on. But still, got the win. And, uh, you know, Brian Ortega kind of outclassed him a little bit. And then, you know, he went in there and used his grappling against Ige. But is he going to be able to use his grappling against Volkanovski? No. He's not going to be able to take Volkanovski down. So it's going to have to be on the feet. And on the feet, Volkanovski is the king of feints. Volkanovski right now is poised to be the best featherweight of all time. Now, currently, it's Jose Aldo. His resume speaks for itself. I put number two still. I don't know. It's tough. You could say Volk beat him twice. I just, come on, man. That fight, that shit's 1-1 in my opinion. I love Volk. They got to settle that shit. I say it's 1-1. Uh, but it is what it is. On paper, he does, has beat Max twice. I still think, even if you have 2-0 Volk, still probably got to, right now, put Max at number two featherweight of all time. But Volk's at three, and he is poised. I think, honestly, he's poised. He's going to keep winning, and he probably will end up being the featherweight, best featherweight of all time. Unless Max can beat him in the next fight. That would really make things crazy, but... He's the king of feints on the on the feet, man. Like I heard somebody say it, and, and it's you can just like not not the faint part, but just the fact somebody said it best. I don't remember who it was, but uh, somebody I think on Twitter or something was saying like this is how Izzy would fight if he was at uh, 145. Like you can see that they train together. They their striking is very similar. Like yeah, it's different because even though he does have long reach for his height, like. He's only 5'6". The man has 71 and a half inch reach for 5'6", which is pretty fucking long. Like, he has longer arms than a lot of guys that have height on him. But at the end of the day, like, he just fights like a short, stubby Israel Adesanya. Like, so many feints. But the thing is, too, with him is he gets to add in those takedowns, man. And he, like, Izzy doesn't have that. And Volk is just, man, like, his striking was so good. He, he doesn't rarely get hit super clean. Max hit him with the cleanest shot I've ever seen Volk hit, get hit by. And then it's like, his, his defense is so good. His chins look good. His fucking fight IQ is so good. He's so good at mixing in his strikes with his takedowns. We saw his heart on full display against Ortega. He was put in two, two submissions that 90% of the roster would have submitted to. Especially that fucking guillotine, bro. That mounted guillotine could have broke his fucking neck, bro. I know 100%. I've been on both sides of that. I've been the one who has a guy in a mounted guillotine, and I'm like, and usually they tap the split second you roll over to mount as if you're under their chin, because you are literally ripping their fucking head off. You can break their neck and kill them. So, like, I've been in competition, and I've had dudes tap before I even, like, as I'm rolling them because the pressure on their neck. I've also been in the position where a guy's, like, not tapping for a second, for a split second. I'm like, bro, like, please. Like, I don't want to break your neck and like, training. But, like, and I've been on the other side of it where, like, that, yo, that shit is, like, it just showed that Volk was, like, Volk lit, like, people say, oh, I was willing to die. No, Volk was literally, like, in the most literal sense, willing to die. Now, did he think I'm going to die if I don't know? But, like, it was a, that shit can happen, man. Like, that was a dangerous submission. It Was the likelihood of that high? No, of course not. But, like, that's one of the most dangerous submissions, dude. I know 100% like firsthand because like, again, I've been on both sides of that and I've like, dude, and I've just seen it a million times. Like when you're under there, that is a straight up neck crank and all your body weight on underneath their chin, pulling their fucking neck off their shoulders. Like that is, and he sat in that for how long? It felt like eternity. I was like screaming at my TV and then even the triangle, like, that's T-City. That's a black, not just any black belt. That's T Triangle City Brian Ortega, who had him in a fully locked triangle. I literally coach people are like, oh, 
what do I do when I get put in a triangle? And I literally tell them that, I mean, there is defenses. Don't get me wrong. Like Volkanovski did everything right. But I'm just saying like, don't let a black belt put you in a triangle and expect to get out. If a black belt puts you in a triangle, you should like it. It's supposed to be over. Like it's, you, you don't just say, okay, I'm in a triangle. I'm going to go ahead and do my defense and I should get out if I do it right. No, if it's the op, it's the opposite. They have to fuck up. And like, Volk dogged out both those submissions. So he's got he's got high level striking, defense, and not just striking, offensive striking, his defense, his chin, his durability overall, his heart, his fight IQ, his fight IQ as in like round management, winning rounds, or time management, winning rounds, striking into his grappling, his takedowns are good, his top control's good. Not that it's not like overwhelming. He doesn't just like he won't like he doesn't typically just get on top and he holds you down the whole time. But you know he's got jujitsu on top. He's got jujitsu on his back. He's got submission defense clearly. He's got the heart to withstand a, a deep submission. He's got the cardio. He's got the good coaches in his ear. Like this dude is the full package. He is one of the best fighters in the world right now. And this is coming from a guy who people call a Volkater. And that's only because I say, bro, 1-1. One, one. Max won that fight. And I get it. I love Max. But I am fair. And I'm ultra fair when this shit's on record and I'm making these videos. Because I know money's on the line and shit. Unfortunately, you've missed the line at this point. He's 8-1. to one. You know, maybe you parlay him. The only tough thing is, like, I don't know how this fight would end. Like... Typically, you would go bulk by decision, dab 10. Had to get the 10th one in. I was going to do it at the end, but I got to do it right at the end of this breakdown instead of to close the video. Typically, you'd say by decision with him. But, man, and I don't like to go off what fighters say in interviews, but he is going hard with the, like, I want to finish. I won't be happy if I don't get a finish. This guy is not on my level. He has respect for Chan Sung Jung, but you can tell he believes this guy is not on my level that can be dangerous sometimes but <clears throat> i don't think volk's the type of guy that's like oh this guy's not on my level i'm not gonna train as hard i think he's the type of guy who's like this guy's not on my level i'm gonna show why he's not on my level i'm gonna show that i'm ahead of this guy and he is just not there like and if that's the case i think he's gonna just he, he's gonna run through him but uh yeah i just uh, that's why i don't want to pick a prop but he, it could go to decision. <laughs> it could He could finish him. If Chan Sung Jung wins, it's going to be by knockout. I mean, maybe catch him in a submission. He's not winning a decision. That's not happening. Um, so you might as well take Chan Sung Jung inside the distance. Maybe catch him in a guillotine or something crazy, I guess. But just don't see that. He probably would have to clip Volkanovski with a perfect punch, knock him out. Um, I don't see it happening. I'm going to go Volk. Man, I'm super torn as by the method. Either late finish or decision. Fourth, fifth, or by decision, I'm going to say. So, that's how I'm going to do it. Um, real quick, I don't have a lot of bets locked in yet, man, honestly. Because a lot of the lines are a little crazy. A lot of the bets that I already had, or, or ones that I already had, but I have a Tyson Fury parlay. That he's he's parlayed up with Piotr Jan and Volkanovski. That this I made like a month ago, back when Volkanovski was four to one and Jan was four to one. Um, I also have Gary minus two twenty five parlayed up with Jan uh, four twenty five and Volkanovski <coughs> four twenty, um, um, or four fifty. Yeah, four fifty. Um, I have Tisha Torres plus one ten. I have Ty Burra, uh, plus 135. I have, um, oh, Tisha Torres again. <laughs> yeah, I doubled up on that. I forgot about that. Um, yeah, Tisha Torres again at plus 110. Um, and then I have to go to decision, minus 150 for Tisha Torres, Dern. And then I have Ty Burra, uh, Rosen Street by decision, plus 160. And uh, run through my picks really quick. I got to get the kids class. Got to teach these fuckers jujitsu. Um, I'm going to go Volkanovski. Um, decision. Uh, even though it could be a late finish. I could, I'm going to go Jan TKO. I'm going to go Shamayev TKO. Torres decision. Pichel decision. Gary knockout. Ty Burra decision. 
Raquel, decision. Mike Malat, decision. Aliniak, sub. Hernandez, submission. Kay Hansen, decision. Julio Arce, decision. Hope you liked the video. Went a little longer than I anticipated, but it is a big pay-per-view, so it is what it is. Uh, I tried to spend most of my time on my, you know, either favorite fights or the ones I was most anticipated, you know, most likely to bet or already bet. Hope you enjoyed it, man. Leave a like on the video. Leave a comment. Hit me up on Twitter. Come through tonight for Twitch. We got the fights, UFC 4 and Fight Night. Some of the best in the world. It's going to be a ton of fun. Um, and yeah, man, I appreciate you. We will be back for the next card. As always, we drop these Wednesday and Thursday, every fight card. I appreciate you guys. Make some money. Enjoy the fights. Come through on Twitch and watch them with me. We'll have a good time. Peace.